And here we are coming to you live once again from our top secret broadcasting compound here at Area 52 at 1233 American Legion Drive, Festus, Missouri, 63028. Just don't tell the NSA where we're broadcasting from. We don't want them listening. Actually, I don't, I don't mind them listening in. I think there's probably lost people at the NSA that need to hear the gospel. Can I get an amen out of somebody? Anyway, it's good to be with you today. And uh, there is a lot, lot going on in this world. I was looking at news articles, and I'm looking at things going on. Drought in California. They're starting to ration water, except all the rich people. Um, and then you've got massive flooding down in the um, in in uh, areas of Texas, Oklahoma, especially Houston, Texas. Um, <clears throat> and something I don't know if you know about Houston, Texas. Um, Houston, Texas has a reputation as being like San Francisco version 2.0. Um, and I'm saying that in reference to there is a very, very large sodomite population in Houston, Texas. They have a sodomite mayor who demanded um, the area pastors um, turn over their sermons so she could check them out to see whether they were being politically correct. And the good pastors were going, shoot, we've been wanting to send you sermons for years. But anyway, a lot of that stuff going on. You got Jade Helm going on down there. I'm surprised somebody, and maybe they have, um, I'm sure there's somebody that's going to make the connection between Operation Jade Helm in Texas with all the flooding. Somebody's going to say that the military caused all of the rain to rain upon Houston as part of this overall effort to take control of the United States via a military coup or a military takeover or so on and so on. Now, what do I believe about what's happening in America? What do I believe about m the possibility of martial law, military takeover, suspending the Constitution? Um, I believe, first of all, Obama has already suspended it in his mind, and probably major members of Congress on both sides of the aisle have already suspended in their mind and in their philosophy the Constitution of the United States of America. What is Jade Helm all about? I don't really know, and I don't think any of the um, the Internet bloggers who specialize in um, excitement news. In other words, they seem to puff things up in order to get uh, hits on their website because the article that you read about Jade Helm on their website was surrounded by at least 20 paying advertisements and the more you click on that website the more money they get out of it uh, keep that in mind keep that in mind um, and some lady wrote me an email the other day she wants me to stop talking about Alex Jones let me tell you what I know about Alex Jones Alex Jones is for sale Alex Jones makes a ton of money from ad revenue from the sale of books and videos and things like that. He makes a ton of money doing this and appearing with uh, uh, Jesse Ventura on conspiracy theory. He makes a lot of money doing this because he says things and I think he hypes a lot of stuff up. He claims to be a Christian. It's not my place to say whether he is or he isn't, but I just see some things that I just, it's not compatible with Bible Christianity. And if you, ever, if you ever hear me say Bible Christianity, there's a reason why I'm saying it. Christianity in general, to me, does not match the Christianity of the Bible. There are people who refer to themselves as Christians all over the world who do not follow every word of God being pure. They don't, they don't believe that. They don't follow it. Um, they're sort of christian s as it were, but they're not Bible-believing Christians. Um, but anyway, all these things going on, and Jade Helm and everything like that, we had um, uh, retired Air Force Colonel 
Al Cuppet, uh, in our church service a couple weeks ago. Al likes me. If you, um, he made a he made a couple of videos for the Club O Prophecy back in the '90s, and that's how I got introduced to him. I watched his uh, his first video. I don't remember if I saw the second one, but I watched the first one. And it was about the time that God was dealing with me about the King James Bible and about looking at numbers in the Bible. And Al uh, had referenced a book by uh, Ed Velo on the mathematics of the King James Bible. And that kind of got me interested. I bought the book. And about that time, God began to deal with me about studying numbers in the Bible. So it was a help to me. Um, Al used to sit on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I think during the Reagan administration, um, to say that he knew some things going on back then, I think he did. He seems to know some things that are going on right now. Um, and Al has visited our church uh, several times. He's, I think he's got a son that lives in the area, and every time he comes to visit him, he comes to our church. He likes me. He, uh, he's, every time I did a club, a club of prophecy tour, prophecy club, uh, and was in the Baltimore area, he would come see me. We'd fellowship, talk. He slipped me 20 bucks one time and uh, winked at me, and he said, I know how it works, and he was referencing how sometimes the speakers for the Prophecy Club back then didn't do well financially, and I was. I was out of money. And um, so anyway, it, it just blessed me, but uh, he, he likes me. He likes what I say. Now, Al and I don't agree on everything. Okay, Al and I do not agree on everything. Al is an old-time Pentecostal. I'm not. And we were talking in my office before church, and he was sharing with me some things, some advice. And I listened to him. I said, Al, I'm receiving what you're saying. I said, but keep this in mind. Here's the left hand. Here's the right hand. The left hand cannot and does not do what the right hand does. And I said, God made me and you different for a reason. Um that doesn't make me wrong and him right doesn't make him wrong and me right it's just god has us designed differently for a different use and different reason but he stood up i gave him an opportunity and uh, this i just kind of felt impressed to i went over to him and asked him before we started the service do you mind standing and maybe giving a word to our people about what you know is going on and he stood and he said some things all the people in our church service heard it um but some of the listeners were not able to hear because the microphone wasn't catching his voice but basically, he said, it's time to wake up, people. There are foreign troops in the United States of America. Do I believe that? I believe that it's possible. I absolutely believe it's possible based upon what I know the Scripture says. In Deuteronomy 28, God made a promise. This was part of the national covenant that God made. He said, if you keep all my laws, statutes, and judgments, then I'll bless you in your cities. I'll bless you in the field. I'll bless your children. I'll bless your coming in and your going out. All of the nations of the world would look up to you. You'll lend to them, and you won't have to borrow from them. But if you turn away from my statutes and my judgments and don't keep all of them, then cursed are you going to be in your cities. And I want to tell you something. I wouldn't live in a major city in this country for all the tea in China. Cursed shall you be in the cities. Ferguson, St. Louis, the riots in, in Baltimore, in places like that, our cities are becoming cursed. And you can just go down the list in Deuteronomy 28 and see that the hand of God is against the United States of America. But one of the things that God promised in Deuteronomy 28 was that um, the stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt be brought down very low. Uh, Ann, um, Ann Coulter um, did an interview, and she's talking about, I think she's got a new book out, but she basically makes the assertion that the liberal Democrats and liberals in this country in general want a massive amount of illegal immigrants to come pouring into this nation. They want that. The reason why they want that is that they want to tip the scales of power in their favor and they want to destroy the Constitution of the United States. I absolutely believe that one. So when, when Al stood up and he said that he knows that there are foreign troops in this country training, I believe it. I believe what he said. Um, he just he talked about, I can't remember everything that he said, but that was sort of the gist of it. He was basically saying to everybody, wake up. Wake up. This is a dangerous time for our nation. It is very critical that we have revival 
in our country. And I'll tell you this. I think before we can expect or demand revival in the country of the United States of America, that we have revival in our churches. And I don't mean revival services where the hired preacher comes in and, and gives three points and a poem and everybody rushes to the altar because that's what they're supposed to do. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about sin-killing, Holy Ghost-filled, Bible-believing revival. That's what we need in our country. Uh, obviously, I'm gonna, we, we are going to talk about the Duggars. I'm going to spend most of this broadcast today talking about Josh Duggar. And if you think that I'm going to try to hurt them, you're wrong. Um, there is somebody out there that I'm going to mention a name that you know that wants this whole Duggar family, they, they want to see them destroyed for some reason. I don't, I don't understand their thinking. But let me deal with this first before I move on. If you have not seen this, this has been on social media. It's some news, some TV news outlets are talking about it. It's a Twitter thing called Charlie Charlie. If you don't know what that is, please, please do the research on it without your children's knowledge, please. There is a very bad, evil spirit rising up in the United States of America. It is a spirit that works in the children of disobedience. I think that the occult is probably more deeply rooted in America than we want to realize or that we can see with our eyes. If you've not heard of this, here's, here's, what, here's what teenagers are doing all across the country. It's spreading like crazy. They'll take a sheet of paper and they'll draw like a little cross, like a, like a box in it, and in each corner they'll write no here and no here in this corner and yes here and yes there in that corner. Basically, they're going to practice divination is what they're going to do. They're going to practice um, contacting familiar spirits and using divination like a Ouija board. And what they'll do is they'll lay a pencil long ways across they'll set the sheet on a table or something like that and lay a pencil down and then lay another pencil crossways of that pencil it'll look like this now if there's any vampires out there you're very offended that i did this aren't you okay but that's what they'll do and there's a ton of videos on this teenagers taking videos or whatever are some of them fake i'm sure some of them are some of them real i i absolutely think some of them are real because what they'll do is they'll just balance this pencil on top of that one and they'll say, Charlie, Charlie, can you hear me? Charlie, Charlie, can you come out and play or whatever? And then all of a sudden, that pencil will turn on its own and point to the word yes. And of course, that's when the screaming and the running and the cursing starts and the OMGs are flying out of their mouths and teenagers running out into the streets screaming bloody murder um, this reminds me of the Ouija board trend back in the 70s I um, knew some people that lived in our neighborhood some young people that were having a party and they decided to get the Ouija board out as if you know being drunk at a teenage party wasn't enough and then they got the Ouija board out and all of a sudden they're doing Ouija things and all of a sudden People start lifting up off the floor in the, in, the garage, in the basement of their house, and they all screamed and ran out and decided that the party was over. I absolutely believe things like that happen. There, there, that, when you practice divination, there is always going to be a spirit that is there. And you know what's sad about the condition of our nation right now? You know what's sad about it? Is that the more that people, especially teenagers, watch these videos and see this pencil turn all by itself, the more they want to try it. That's why I say, if you don't know what this is, you're going to do the research. Don't let your kids see what you're doing. And I may have explained probably more so than what I should have, but I'm just telling you, it is divination. Do not and set your kids down and say, please do not do this. Don't try it. Don't think about it. Don't dwell on it. 
And if you do this, I will beat you to within an inch of your life. That's what my mom used to say all the time. And I often wondered, how long then would the beating be if she was going to work her way down to where I just had an inch of life left? Never could figure that part out. But um, parents, please, 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 I cannot express this enough. Sit down with your children and tell them, don't do this. And if you got to get mean about it, get mean about it, because it is divination. It is consulting with familiar spirits. And I want to tell you something. They'll show up. They will. They'll show the, I, I think the. I think the time of demonic oppression, possession, demonic appearances in this nation, I think that we're approaching that time in this country. So please, parents, be warned. Now, the Duggars. I don't watch um, the Duggars. My wife does. She knows how many kids they have now, and she knows all their names, and she follows the program. And, and I'll say this. Um, I don't know, and I don't think anybody does. I don't think anybody really knows the family but what they see on television. Um, and that's true of our, even our neighbors. We don't really know our neighbors but what we see from day to day. We don't know other church members but what we see out of them in church. Maybe you might work with some of your church members or whatever. Um, I do. I work with my church members. They're my three daughters. My niece works here. Uh, Rose, our secretary, works here. Uh, Melissa, John's wife, works here. And um, so I, I know a little bit more about the people that work here, but we, we just don't know a lot of things. And we don't know everything that the Duggars do. We don't know everything they believe. We don't know everything that they do in private. Do, do the Duggars spank their children? I'm sure they do. Do they ever do it on TV? No, absolutely not. And I'm, and I'm reasonably sure that the, the Duggars themselves, the parents, I don't even know their names, Jim Bob and... I don't know. Anyway, I'm reasonably sure that when it comes to family privacy, I think that for the most part, they are in charge of what the cameras pick up and film from um, uh, film of their children. I am reasonably sure that they are have a lot of say about what video goes out of their house to the public. And, I, and that's the way I think it should be. Um, and, and granted, if we're dealing with um, some of these other reality TV shows, like some that are on MTV or some that are on Spike TV or whatever, there's, there's like these TV shows. I have never watched them, but I've seen advertisements about redneck something, and it follows these really trashy country bums drunkards and forn and fornicators and whoremongers around and they're jumping from bed to bed and they're getting drunk and they're getting in fist fights and if anything like this ever popped up about one of them they're they're going boy Erica, we're going to get a ratings increase that's for sure because that's how they live their life uh but if you have not heard the news it has come out that joshua duggar who i think is the oldest son in the Duggar family, when he was 14 years old, um, put his hands on some girls where they should not have been. Uh, Paul was right when he said, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. He was absolutely dead on on that issue. Uh, this was done when he was a minor. According to, um, what's, what, according to what's known about it is that when the father, Jim Bob, learned of it, he went to the authorities with it. Um, I don't know all the details about uh, what process uh, happened as far as um, as far as law enforcement or, or anything like that. I, I don't know all of the details offhand. I think you can probably find out a lot. I did read um, a large portion of the police report because it was put online, but it was redacted to keep the names of the minor children out, and that's the right thing to do. Um, and I'm not going to discuss exactly what he did and to whom. I'm not going to discuss that. 
but he he sinned. He touched women, girls. He's 14 years old. You remember what it's like to be 14 years old? I'm not justifying it. I'm just telling you. We, I remember. I remember being 14. I remember being 13. I remember looking at this girl across my classroom, and I just could not get her out of my mind, and I'm just... And she wanted nothing to do with me. I remember those days, and, and so probably do you and should you when it comes to understanding things like this. Kids are kids. They're not, they're not small adults. They do stupid things. That's why we don't let them drive. That's why we don't give them guns at a young age. This is why we, we don't let them sign contracts. This is why we don't let them get married. There, there's all kinds of things that we don't let kids do because their brains are not there yet. They don't understand everything. They're growing, but they don't do it. But he did some things that were very, very wrong. But you have to ask the question, at his age, how much of that realistically goes on all over the country at his age? Uh, he was 14 at the time. He was still a minor child in the eyes of the law. Now, um, there's two sides to this, and I will tell you up front, I am on the, and I always am on the side of grace and mercy, always. Sometimes I need to be reminded of that. But I am always on the side of mercy and grace. And I'm going to deal with that. I'm going to deal with Scripture today. But let me tell you who's on the other side of this whole Duggar thing. Let me tell you. I'm going to read. This is, this is public, so I'm going to read it. Um, Arizona pastor's wife condemns liberal Duggars, saying sexual deviants should be executed. Arizona pastor's wife. Now, can you think of a pastor that you might know of that is from Arizona? The wife of Arizona pastor, Stephen Anderson, who predicted an AIDS-free Christmas if all gays were killed, has condemned the Duggar family as, quote, worldly liberals who promote a false gospel. Susanna Anderson said she never met the stars of TLC's 19 Kids and Counting, but the mother of eight children has streamed every one of their regular episodes and specials because she likes seeing and learning from the daily workings of a large family. The wife of Pastor Stephen Anderson, who bars homosexuals and demands silence from women at his faithful word, Baptist Church in Tempe, said in a blog post she disapproved of the deceptive way the Duggars practiced their faith. This is a quote from Susanna Duggler. We, are, Susanna Dugler, Susanna Anderson, this is a quote from her. We have for years held and publicly stated that the Duggars are liberal and worldly, even as they are known for being fundamentalist, Anderson said. Quote, maybe their beliefs are, but what they are publicly willing to take a stand for is weak and anemic. This is what she said. For example, she said Jim, Bob, and Michelle refused to acknowledge that they spanked their children and instead focused on their, quote, positive approach of praising their children's good behavior. Anderson said she had no doubt that Josh Duggar, who admitted to police as a teen that he had, and I'm just going to leave that part out, had been, she is convinced that he has been sexually abused himself. Now, she has no evidence for this, but this is what she thinks and this is what she's saying. But she was unforgiving toward the 27-year-old married father if, um, if he had become a reprobate pedophile. She said, I believe that all pedophiles are reprobates, that they are unregenerate and, in fact, can never change, and that they, like all sexual deviants, should be executed as the Bible demands, lest they spread their abusive ways and corrupt more innocent lives. That is a direct quote. Let me read that again. This is Susanna Anderson, the wife of Stephen Anderson. She says, 
I believe that all pedophiles are reprobates, that they are unregenerate and, in fact, can never change, and that they, like all sexual deviants, should be executed as the Bible demands, lest they spread their abusive ways and corrupt more innocent lives. She goes on to say, I do not believe that pedophiles or other deviants who claim to have found God are telling the truth, she added. I believe this is a lie that they tell to gain access to easy targets, namely children in church, at camp, and etc. Unquote. Anderson said the Duggars, quote, have always been running in circles known to attract freaks and weirdos since leaving a, quote, soul winning independent Baptist church to join a home church affiliated with ATI, which is Advanced Training Institute. Um, can't remember the guy's name. Um, Bill Gothard. Envision Forum, which saw their leaders brought down by sex scandals. That is true. She said the Duggars promote, quote, a false gospel. Do you know what, do you know what Stephen Anderson preaches? I'm going to get into that here in a minute. She said that the Duggars promote, quote, a false gospel that calls for, quote, repentance from sins rather than following the Bible and associated obviously associated with obviously false prophets such as creationist Ray Comfort and actor Kirk Cameron. Quote, because of this, I have only ever given them a 50-50 chance of truly being saved, Anderson said. I am thankful that when I die and stand in judgment, that this woman nor her husband will be seated on that throne. She goes on to say, unless I talk to them in person, it is, is impossible for me to give my opinion on it accurately, just because, as with everything else, they are so wishy-washy, it's hard to put a finger on it. I give their children even less of a chance of being saved, since it seems all they have ever known is this false gospel crowd. That's her words. She said the Duggars had missed an opportunity to promote religious doctrine on their reality show, but she said it was reckless and irresponsible for the parents to agree to appear on the program with such skeletons in their family closet. It was insane to think that they could become celebrities, and, and this not come to light as, with, uh, as many people as were involved in it, Anderson said. Did they consider the repercussions of their son's life, who would even, under the best of circumstances, have been reeling to recover from this, if that is even possible? Do they think the world who was looking for any way to attack them was going to look the other way on this? Great shame has been brought upon the cause of Christ through their desire to be rich, popular, or both. And that is from Susanna Anderson, wife of Stephen Anderson. Now, what false gospel is she referring to? Stephen Anderson, and if you don't believe what I say, you just go check it out for yourself. Stephen Anderson preaches a gospel quote-unquote gospel that denies repentance. In, he not only preaches a gospel that denies repentance, he actively goes after well-known pastors, preachers, Christian bloggers, or whoever, whoever, maybe even me, I don't know, who say that repentance is a part of your salvation. He goes after them and calls them all false prophets. And this is, this is what his wife is saying, the reason why she seriously doubts Michelle Duggar's salvation and to go as, so far as to say that she doubts that any of her children would ever be truly saved because they have heard the word repent as part of salvation. Anderson teaches in a brand of eternal security. This is why don't ever ask me if I believe in eternal security because there's at least 20 or 30 different versions of it out there. And it's the, the phrase is not in the Bible. Ask me if I believe John 3.16. Ask me, ask me if I believe Romans 10.9 and 10. Ask me if I believe Ephesians chapter 2. Ask me if I believe uh, Hebrews 6. I, abs I believe every word in this book. Ask me if God preserves his saints. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Ask me if we are told and instructed by Paul to hold on to our faith. Absolutely. But don't ever ask me if I believe in eternal security or losing your salvation, because none of those terms are found in the Scriptures. True salvation, it's never lost. It's never lost. Here is Anderson's version of the gospel. Anderson says, you just believe, pray the prayer, and it doesn't matter what happens after that. You can go and be a witch. You can go and be whatever you want to be and do whatever you want to do. Never darken the door of a church. Never pick up a Bible. Never do anything. And you're going to go to heaven. I don't think so. I don't th and and it's, again, it's not what I think. That is not, that is not what this Bible talks about, the fruits of righteousness, the fruits of repentance, the evidence that a person has the indwelling Holy Spirit in their heart and the Spirit of God's Son crying, Abba, Father. There, there is no salvation that way. It's, it's not possible. But he denies the doctrine of repentance. And he actively goes after people who believe in it and teach it and preach it. And I'm one of them. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you why. I'm one of them, because the Bible tells me that that's how God sees it. That's how God teaches it. That's what the Bible says. Now, let me, let me read some scriptures. Matthew 9, 13. Here's what Jesus said, but go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's the words of Jesus Christ. Now, I posted something on Facebook a little, little while ago. Uh, I was reading in Romans. I probably won't be able to find it again just by opening my Bible up. But I was reading in Romans, and it was talking about Abraham. Yeah, here it is right here. And in Romans chapter 4, Here's what, here's what Paul said, and therefore it was imputed to him. This is verse 22 of Romans 4. Therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it, is not, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. There, there are people out there who I would read Matthew 9.13 and they would say, well, that's not for us. That's not written for us. In other words, it disagrees with their doctrinal statement, so therefore, it must be to somebody else, but not them. I don't, I don't do that. Right there, Paul talked about how what was written for Abraham was not just written for Abraham, it was written to us as well. Paul said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine. All scripture. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, these things are written for us as an admonition and an example to us that we should not follow after what Israel did in the wilderness. It was written to us, for us, and it applies to us. Even in, in, in the Olivet Discourse, in Mark chapter 13, Matthew 24, in Mark 13, at the Olivet Discourse, where he's talking about the signs that are going to happen at the end of the age, Jesus himself said, but what I say unto you... I say unto all. You know what I think? I think that we ought to go back to our Bible, read it from Genesis to Revelation, and then start formulating our doctrines and our ideas. Not just adopting what somebody said and then using one little skinny verse that makes it look like they're right. Get the whole counsel of God in on what it is that you believe. If you believe, if you're going to stand on this idea that repentance is works and you don't do works for salvation, therefore anybody who preaches repentance is preaching a false accursed gospel. If you want to hang on to that, then be my guest. But the scriptures deny that doctrine as being true. Jesus said, I am come, I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, Take this and apply every verse that I'm going to read here. Take it and apply it 
to Joshua Duggar's life and ask the question, did he commit a sin that cannot be forgiven? According to Anderson, he did. And you need to remember, Stephen Anderson teaches that no homosexual, no sodomite can ever be saved. Zero. And that's not what the Bible says. The Apostle Paul talked about the works of the flesh, and one of them, he's, he's talking about adultery, fornication, lasciviousness, being effeminate. And Paul said, and such were some of you, but now you're clean. I sat at the bedside of a young man who had given his life to sodomy, and he was dying of AIDS. His sister asked him, would you like for my pastor to come and see you? And he said, yes, please. So she called for me, and I went up there and talked. I was praying, God, I don't know how in the world I'm going to deal with this. God, I don't know what in the world I'm going to say. And God said, I'll just, I'll, I'll do the talking. And I got up there, and I, and I wasn't, I was nice. I was very loving. But I told this young man, you're living a lifestyle that you know God doesn't approve of. And he said, yeah. And I said, you're dying of AIDS, aren't you? Yeah. Would you like to go to heaven when you die? Yeah. So I led him through the Romans road, and he confessed Jesus as his Savior and asked God to forgive him of his sins, and he repented. And I did his funeral in our church because I knew where he was. But Anderson would say, that people like Josh Duggar, other quote-unquote deviants, let me tell you something. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. All of us. In fact, let me, let me deal with this from the Scriptures. Anderson would have you believe that there are, there are some people who commit sins that are of a special case that the Bible does not apply to them. Let me read this to you. In Romans chapter 3, verse 9, What then, are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Not Stephen Anderson, not Susanna Anderson, not Michelle Duggar, and not Mike Hoggard. None of us, none of us are righteous. There is none that understand it. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. Boy, ain't that true when you wake up in the morning and your wife or your husband breathes on you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, he said, who died in there? Their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues they have used deceit, the poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. You know what that, you know what that sounds like to me? That sounds like the, uh, the vine of Sodom. Their feet are, you go read Deuteronomy 32, because their, their mouth is full of the poison of asps. And it's full of bitterness. That's what Deuteronomy 32 says is the vine of Sodom. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, but that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. And let me tell you something. Anybody out there who wants to stand up and, and, and act like that because they didn't do this particular sin, that they are in fact better than everybody else, you're wrong, and God said you're wrong. In fact, in fact, let's deal with something that I, I have heard all my life, and at one time I thought it was the right thing. Remember the woman that they brought to Jesus in adultery? John chapter 8, verse 3. Here's what the Bible says. Not what anybody else says. Here's what the Bible says. 
John 8, 3, and the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. And everybody's going, oh. Acting like, oh, that's terrible. They say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that, he, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Do you know what he was doing? Do you know what Jesus was doing when he, when he heard what they said? He stooped down and started writing with his finger on the ground. And, and then he did it again. Um, let's see here. In, the, in verse 8, again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Do you know what he was doing? Write this down, Jeremiah 17, 13. Open your Bible up to John 8 and right next to it, Jeremiah 17, 13. Here's what that verse says. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Wow. I think Jesus was there writing them in the earth because they had forsaken God, and he knew it. That's why there is very conspicuously the other half of the adultery missing from this little circle of condemnation here. And you know what that is, don't you? That is justifying one person or one group while you condemn the rest of them. That's what that is. So anyway, Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote in the ground as though he heard them not. In verse 7, so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Now, I had heard from the Greek scholar preachers who said, now, in the original Greek, what this passage implies is, let he that is without this sin, let him first cast a stone at her. It gives the, then the doctrine and the impression that as long as you didn't do this, you're okay, you can cast a stone. But that's not what it says. Jesus never said it. He never would have said it. He didn't say it, and he's not ever going to say it. He said, let him that is without sin among you. Let me read it. Let me read it. Let him first cast a stone at her. Jesus knew that of all the people in this little common area here, the sinner woman the accusers, the crowd that was surrounding here, and Jesus himself. Jesus knew that the only one of them that was qualified to throw a stone was, of course, Jesus. That's what he knew. And he didn't just say, anybody here not guilty of adultery, please start pelting this young lady with stones. He didn't say that. He said, let him that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone. Now, I want to tell you something, people. We have no right to cast stones at other believers who have sinned and fallen short of, of um, what is it? all the sin that comes short of the glory of God. None of us have a right. Because, here's what, here's what Paul says. Here's what he says. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Let's see, we're here. In the Romans chapter 2, turn there. Romans chapter 2, um, verse 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. You see, everybody with a false gospel, they will always boast against everybody else that they think is preaching a false gospel. 
they will always elevate themselves. And, and when I say false gospel, normally there is always works attached to it of some kind. And people love to do works for God and then boast about it. And he says, the, the Jews rest in the law and make us thy boast of God, verse 18, and knowest his will and approvest the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law and art confident that thou, art, thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which is the form of knowledge and the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou that not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Now, let me talk to preachers just for a minute. I'm one of them. Do you know what I'm required to do by the Scripture? I'm required to get up in front of our congregation and preach against my own sins. Now, I'm, thank God I'm not required to confess them all to everybody in the church. But I am required by the scriptures to preach against things that I do wrong. Let me tell you something, that's tough. It's not easy to do. But I'm telling you, preachers, listen to me. I know us. I know who we are and I know what we're made of. We're made out of the same dirt that our people were made out of. That's what we're made out of. We have fallen short of the same glory of God as everybody else in our congregation and everybody else that we hope to witness to and preach to. We're in the same lot as they are. And you know what God, you know what God wrote into the law? And God is so wise. He knows the condition of man. He knows man loves to boast, especially when it comes to religious things. You know what God put in the law? God put in the law that when somebody brought a sacrifice for the sins of them or their family, and this is actually mirrored in the book of Hebrews because it's telling you that the Levites had to go sacrifice for themselves for their own sins, but Christ, when he came, he wasn't sacrificing for himself for, for his own sins. He didn't have any sins. That's what makes him a better sacrifice, a better high priest. But before the Levite priest could offer the sacrifice for the people that brought him the sacrifice for their sins. He had to offer a sacrifice for his own sins first. Had to deal with his own sins first. So that the priest standing there at the gate of the tabernacle, when somebody was coming up with a goat or a turtle dove or fine flour and oil or whatever it was, the priest wasn't standing there going, <laughs> I was wondering when you were going to show up. Word around the village, word around the, uh, the camp here is that you've been getting around pretty good, haven't you? What makes you think that you have any right to approach the most holy God? God knew the condition of man. They would put a religious hat on him. He loves to elevate himself above other people. And God said, priest, before you offer that sacrifice for their sins, you offer it up for your own first. Judgment begins at the house of God, doesn't it? Preachers, start preaching against your own sins and preach it with conviction so that while you're preaching, the Holy Ghost gets a hold of your heart and smites you as a son. Because if you don't, you're a hypocrite. You're laying blame on everybody else in your congregation and elevating yourself. And I want to tell you something. I've sat under you guys. I've sat under preachers who did that. I don't like you. I don't like you at all. Elevate yourself as if you're some high and mighty thing that doesn't ever do anything wrong. And then beat up and blast your own sheep that God gave you. As if... They're constantly in the wrong, and you almost really never are. And that's what he says here. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? 
Sure you have. Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Sure you have. Sure you have. You've looked at women in your congregation. I, dare I say you've looked at teenage girls in your congregation. And what did Jesus say? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? Sure you do. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written, for circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of man, but of God. But basically, the, the concept here in Romans 2 and 3 is, God has concluded every one of us under sin. And it doesn't matter what sin it is. Whether it was the sin of Josh Duggar, or whether it was the sin of some other person. It's still sin. It all had to be died for by the same Messiah, by the same Christ. It all had to be atoned for by the same blood. That blood had to be offered up for the sins of the entire world. No exceptions whatsoever. Your sins are not better than somebody else's. Quit thinking that way. Those of you who want to elevate yourself above Duggar or above anybody else, that has made stupid mistakes in their life. Because why? Because they got a flesh that is so full of guile and deceit and wickedness and perversion and corruption. This body is so rebellious to the, to the wonderful law of God. The body will not obey God. It refuses. That's why it's got to be killed. It's got to be sacrificed every day. It's got to be offered up because it is vile and it's wicked. And here, he, and you know what the Apostle Paul is leading up to? Romans 7. Paul himself confessing in Romans 7, O wretched man that I am. Present tense. You know, you know what the original Greek says there? O wretched man that I am. I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> the same thing. Anyway, where's my paper? Back to this. Mark, this is, this is repentance now. Mark 1.15, and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent ye and believe the gospel. See, I'm telling you, I'm going to tell you something. It goes hand in hand. If you're going to believe the gospel and believe what God said, you will repent. Are we saved by faith only, or as James said, he, was, he said, you show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Because we know that many people say they believe in Jesus, but they do not what he says. And I listen, I'm not preaching work salvation. God forbid that I ever, ever even sound like that. But the whole purpose of James' teaching about faith and works is, is that those who say they have faith in God, and yet they do not the works that God created them unto, they're lying through their teeth. That's what he was, that's what he was getting at. That's what he was saying. Everybody does exactly what they truly believe. And I've used this illustration before. There are never any atheists who come to my church sing the hymns, stand up and testify, say amen during my sermons, tithe, and, and have church. There are no atheists who come and say, Preacher, that was one of the best sermons I've ever heard in my life. Atheists don't do that. You know why? They don't believe in God. They're not going to amen my messages. They're not going to go seek out the counsel of God in his word. They don't even believe in it. 
They think the Bible is a book written for men. And what I'm saying is, if you really believe what the Bible says, it'll be manifest in what you do. And repentance is that first manifestation. If you believe what God said, you will repent. Luke chapter 17, verse 3. Take heed to yourself. If thy brother... Now listen to this now. Think about Josh Duggar. Or let me say this. Think about somebody that hurt you as a child or as an adult. Take heed to yourself. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent. Thou shalt forgive him. In Matthew 18, 21, there's a variation of this. It's not contradictory to what you find in Luke 17. They're complementary to one another. Boy, that is a nice hat you've got. Thank you. I love that jacket. See, it's complementary to each other. Matthew 18, 21 says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him till seven times? You see, back in Luke, he said seven times in a day. Until seven times, Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. That's 490 times, one day. And you say, well, he did that, and he like did it again. He like did it several times. I mean, he's got a boy, he's got a problem. You know what I'm going to say to that? You better get down on your knees and thank God Almighty that you don't have the thorn in your flesh to deal with that he does. Or maybe you do. Luke 24, 47, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And why won't Anderson and others like him, why won't they preach that? Why won't they do what the book says? Repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. Acts 2.38. The very first sermon ever preached, the first word that came out was repent. Acts 2.38, then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 3.19, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. You want your sins blotted out? Repent. Acts 11:18. when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. King James Bible is what it says. Acts 17, 30, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. He commanded us to repent. And here... This pastor, Arizona pastor, and his wife. What you don't hear is, man, I feel bad for him. I feel bad for his family for having to go through this. Uh, I'm praying for them that, that God would let them shine the light of God's mercy in that God takes sinners and he saves them and he cleans them up. And though they strive against sin, God's mercy is everlasting to them. That's what I didn't hear from this article I read. All I read was, I don't think he can ever be saved, and I doubt even that the whole family is even saved. That 50-50 chance is what I give them. And the kids, pff, they'll probably never be saved. That's what I heard. Romans 2, verse 2, But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Amen. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same? Doest 
the same? Oh, you didn't do it with your hands. No. Mm -mm. You did it with your eyes and your heart. That's what you did. Yeah, kid, kid, I, you're probably hearing from me a little bit of bitterness. It's there, buddy. Because I have been in fundamental churches all my life and have seen people act better than other people because they had the King James Bible and they believed in this doctrine and they stood for this and bless God, brother so-and-so, he's preached all these messages and he's won thousands of people to the Lord. And the man was having an affair on his, with his mistress. Go, go look at the story of Jack Hiles. Two Bible colleges, I don't know how many Christian schools, had the largest church in the entire country. Everybody in the country is following his methods, his manuals on soul winning and church building and bus ministries and everything else. And his daughter's going around the entire country saying, my dad was a cult leader. He had a mistress that lived down the road. We all knew it. He hated my mom. That's what she said. I'm just telling you, church people, we're living in a, we're living in a time, in a season right now, church, that's not Mayberry, leave it to Beaver, Father knows best type stuff. We don't live in that world anymore. It's gone. The, the purity and the innocency that was the American family is gone. And we are striving in our churches, and rightfully so as Christians, to defend the sanctity of marriage, to promote wholesome Christian living, we're doing everything we can. But the truth of it is, we are so vexed by this world like Lot was. We are so vexed by this evil and corrupt generation that sin is afflicting people, Christians, Bible-believing Christians, churches, pastors, leaders, reality show people. It's affecting everybody. And I think we need to deal with it the way our Savior and our Bible tells us to deal with it. If somebody sins, go to them. Go to them so that they can repent. You don't go to them. You make statements like this about them. Anyway, thinkest thou this, this is Romans chapter 2, verse 3, O man that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to what? You know what that word is? Repentance. 2 Corinthians 7.10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And let me just say this. I, I absolutely believe, I absolutely totally believe in my heart that the God of this world, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience is going to take this situation. I'll, I'll even say this. There's no doubt in my mind that Joshua Duggar was set up. No, the Illuminati didn't come to him. No, he didn't. He wasn't uh, brainwashed in a CIA monarch mind control program. The devil set him up. And you know what I've noticed? You know what I've seen? I got a, I got a pastor friend. And I love him dearly. Preaches some good messages. Got a wisdom I just don't have, and I like to hear him every now and then. He had an uncle that, I mean, messed him up bad when he was a kid. You know what I told him? I said, I think the devil can smell and sense a man of God from a long way off. When we see snakes stick their tongue out, what are they doing? 
What are they doing? Are they going, you can't hurt me. No, they're not. You know what they're doing? They're sensing what's going on around them. They're, they're sampling the air, and they're either looking for predators or the prey. They're sensing danger coming. Why did Pharaoh, why did Pharaoh want to have all the babies killed? There was a devil behind him that's going, I think there's a savior coming. I got to act quick. Oh, sure there was Moses. Oh, yeah, he was coming all right. And I think the devil sensed it. Why did Herod want all the babies killed? Because he knew there was a child born that was going to be the king. In, Re in Revelation chapter 12, where do we find the dragon? He's right in front of the woman waiting be, who's waiting to deliver that man-child who's going to rule all nations with the rod of iron, and he's waiting to devour him as soon as he's born. And I want to tell you something, people. There are probably a lot of you listening today. The devil set you up. He tried to destroy you at the earliest age possible, didn't he? He was trying to make sure that you never could serve God in your life. That's what I think. And that's what I think happened here. Not, not to just Josh, but to everybody that was involved in that. That was a setup. To get him under control under bondage so that he would never serve God. And the devil, yeah, I think he can read the Bible. I just don't think he understands all of it. I think he doesn't believe it. Had he known the Bible, known what, how it was all going to turn out, he would have never crucified the Lord of glory, the Bible says. Joseph upon hearing his brothers murmur in the background about, do you think Joseph did all this to kill us? Do you think he's, you think he's setting us up? And, and Joseph went to him and said, guys, don't you understand? I'm not mad at you. What you meant to me for evil, God meant to you for good. I'm not bitter against you. I can see clearly that what you did brought me to the place where I could be here for you guys in your time of need. And you know what I think? I think God can give him, Josh Duggar, everybody else involved, and you a better chance and a better opportunity and a better personal ministry than what he had before. Because that's just how God works. I'm telling you, that's how he works, people. When God was looking for a man whom he was going to allow to write the majority of the New Testament, 